All righty, well, Pastor asked me to come tonight and uh, teach, and I'm glad to do that. Um, he wasn't going to be here, but he is. <laughs> so, praise the Lord. Uh, but we're going to we're going to get into the Word. Let's uh, let's just open up prayer before we get started. Father, we thank you for this time that we have together. We believe to receive from your Word. We believe, Father, the Holy Spirit is the teacher of the true uh, of the uh, church, the true teacher. And so, Father, we just open ourselves up to him to receive revelation knowledge from your word. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so what I thought we'd do tonight, be it a Wednesday night, and then, you know, we call it the hour of power, is we're going to do a little uh, review on faith. No surprise there because I love teaching on faith. Uh, but let's go to Luke chapter 11. And as we do that, uh, if you want to turn to Luke 11 and also Mark 11, of course, we've got to go to Mark 11 to talk about uh, faith because that is the scripture Brother Hagin wrote. <laughs> uh, a lot of people think that. They really do, but, uh, but that's okay. Let's, uh, matter of fact, let's start Mark 11. I said Luke 11 first, but let's start Mark 11. We're going to just read the whole uh, teaching of Mark 11. When they came nigh to Jerusalem unto Bethpage at Bethany at the Mount of Olives, he sent forth two of his disciples and said unto them, Go your way over to the village against you, and as soon as you be entered into it, you'll find a colt, colt tied, whereupon uh, never man sat, loose him and bring him. If any man say to you, Why do you do this? Say unto the Lord that the Lord hath need of him, and straightway he will send him hither. And they went their way and found the colt tied by the door without in a place where two ways met, and they loose him. And uh, they went their way and found the colt tied by the door without a place where the two ways met, and they loose him. And certain of them that stood there said unto him, What do ye loosing the colt? I mean, it would be like today, walking up to a car, jumping in it, start cranking it up. People look at it and go, whoa, guys, what you doing? <laughs> Taking my car. Yeah. And so, as the Lord told them to do, they said, well, they did even as Jesus commanded, they, uh, and they let him go. They said, uh, the Lord has need of him. Well, wouldn't that be nice? Jump in a car and take off and say, the Lord has need of him. <laughs> I think there was something supernatural at work here. I think the Lord was, was leading them and the people that owned the cult. Uh, and they said unto them, even as Jesus had commanded, they let them go. And then verse 7, And they brought the colt to Jesus. They cast their garments on him. He sat upon him. And many spread their garments in the way, and others cut down branches off the trees and strawed them uh, in the way. Let's see. Uh, my mouse jumped here. Let me... Verse 9, And they went before, and they that followed cried, saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed be the kingdom of our father David, that cometh in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. And Jesus entered in Jerusalem and into the temple. And when they looked round about on all things, now the eventide was come, and he went unto Bethany with the twelve. Now, kind of set this up. We're reading this out of the King James, but just to kind of set it up. Jesus, you might say his headquarters for this missions trip, or this uh, ministry trip, was in Bethany. That's where he was working out of. Now, Bethany is a suburb, essentially, of Jerusalem. And that suburb is, oh, you know, about a 30-minute walk away, thereabouts. And so they had to leave Bethany and go to Jerusalem. Then, as they ministered there in Jerusalem, they had to leave Jerusalem and go back to Bethany. So basically what it said here is when the even tide was come, when it got started getting dark, uh, he went back to Bethany, back to home base, with the twelve. Verse 12, and on the morrow, when they came from Bethany, so they left their ministry headquarters there, so to speak, <laughs> there in Bethany, and start for Jerusalem. This is in the morning. And uh, as he, you know, it's morning, Jesus is hungry, you know, he wants to have breakfast. He looks over off from the road and he sees a fig tree. And now this fig tree had leaves. Now, basically, you know, if you know something about fig trees, the leaves don't bud out until it's ready to have fruit. So 
the tree was basically demonstrating, saying, if you will, by manifesting leaves that it had fruit. So Jesus, being hungry, says, hey, I'm just going to leave the path here, walk over off the side of the road to this fig tree. I'm going to get something to eat. So uh, he came, if happily he might find anything thereon. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the time of figs was not yet. Now, you might say, well, you know, why did Jesus expect there to be figs if it wasn't the season for figs? Well, because he saw the leaves. The tree was saying, in effect, if you want to look at it as the tree talking, but you know what I'm saying, it was demonstrating, I should have fruit. So even though it wasn't the right time, Jesus expected to find figs there. And Jesus answered and said unto it. Now, I've always wondered about this phrase, Jesus answering said. The tree didn't exactly talk to him, but the tree was, in effect, talking to him or demonstrating that it should have figs. It was kind of lied to him, if you will. So Jesus answered and said unto it, No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. And, you'll note, it says, his disciples heard him. So he wasn't mumbling. <laughs> he wasn't like a lot of people, you know, ah, stupid tree, I ought to have figs and it doesn't. No, he wasn't doing it that way. He actually intentionally spoke words to the tree. Now, I don't think Jesus ever did anything haphazardly or lightly. You've got to know that Jesus chooses his words and chooses when to speak them. He knew, I believe, that he was going to use this as an example. He probably also was frustrated with a stupid tree not having figs. But I'm sure he thought to himself, well, this will be a good opportunity. You know, he's always looking for word pictures, always looking for ways to teach the disciples. So here he is talking to the tree, loud enough that the disciples heard it. Now remember, he's walked off the side of the road to do this. So the disciples, I suspect, were still on the road kind of waiting on him to come back. And so they hear him from all the way over wherever he was off the road with his tree. So apparently, like I say, he didn't whisper it. He didn't just mumble it. He spoke directly, specifically to that tree. Well, the disciples heard it. Fine. What happens? Then they came to Jerusalem. So he gets, he gets into the city where he's going to minister that day. And he does in a very powerful way. Uh, it says, when he was come to Jerusalem, Jesus went into the temple... He began to cast out them that sold and bought the temple, overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves, and would not suffer that any man should carry any vessel through the temple. And he taught, saying unto them, Is it not written, My house should be called of all nations the house of prayer? But you've made it a den of thieves. And the scribes of the chief priests heard it and sought how they might destroy him, for they feared him, because all the people were astonished at his doctrine. Now the thing about that phrase astonished at his doctrine. Doctrine simply means teaching. So Jesus didn't just walk into the temple early that morning, toss over some you know, uh, uh, tables, and then leave. He spent the day teaching. And the people there heard his teaching and were astonished at what he was teaching. They were astonished at his doctrine. I believe he spent the whole day there teaching because this was the evening. He left Bethany in the morning. He spoke to the fig tree. He goes to the temple, does whatever he does there in the temple, and then it says, and then even was come. So apparently, he spent the whole day there in the temple. Now I believe he spent it teaching, ministry, probably healing the sick, because everywhere Jesus went, he preached, he taught, and he healed. Those three elements are the elements of Jesus' earthly ministry. Brother Hagin's pointed that out many times. Preaching, teaching, and healing. So that's what I believe he did while he was there in the temple during the day. The day passed, even was come, and they went out of the city of Jerusalem. Where did they go? Back to Bethany. So they go back to headquarters. Now remember, this is just headquarters for this particular ministry trip. And so they're there in Bethany, spending the night. He gets up the next morning, where is he going to go? He's going to go back to Jerusalem. He's going to go teach there again. In the morning, as they pass by, they pass by that same fig tree that he talked to. Now, common sense tells us that 24 hours had passed because it was the morning of the previous day that he talked to the tree. He spent the day in Jerusalem. 
He leaves Jerusalem, goes back to Bethany in the evening, it says. Then he gets up in the morning and he goes back, you would assume about the same time that he went the day before, to Jerusalem. So about 24 hours have passed. And as they passed by, they saw the fig tree had dried up from the roots. Now, the fig tree being dried up from the roots is an actual physical manifestation. Okay, nothing spiritual about it. That fig tree had dried up. So something had occurred. And the disciples noticed it. And you know Peter, <laughs> being the loud mouth that he was, is the one that had to point it out. And so Peter calling to remembrance, well, he had to call to remembrance because it's 24 hours ago, right? So he calls to remembrance. He said to him, Master, behold, the fig tree which thou cursed is withered away. And Jesus, I can see him grinning, said, have faith in God, or some Greek references say, have the God kind of faith. Matter of fact, in the Today's Living Version, there's a footnote, and in that footnote, it says specifically, have God's faith. That's pretty powerful. No matter how you look at it, <laughs> have God's faith? I mean, it's one thing to talk about your faith. You know, we know that like the woman with the issue of blood, Jesus told her, woman, your faith has made you whole. But what Jesus is saying here, this is how you use the God kind of faith. What did God do with his faith? We know from Hebrews chapter 11 that the worlds, all the worlds that were created, were framed by the word of God, by the words that God spoke out of his own mouth. And that is through or by the means of his faith, that he spoke those words. And as a matter of fact, I mean, we know from Genesis, you go back to Genesis and look, what did he do? He said, let there be light, and there was light. And actually, in the Hebrew, it's even clearer, because in the Hebrew, it's the one word, light, but in the present tense. So it's as, if, as though God looked into the absolute darkness, the absolute blackness, where there was nothing on top of nothing on top of nothing, and he was there, because he's always existed, and he looked out at everything, there was nothing there, and he said, light. In other words, as though he saw light there. Well, what was he doing? Romans chapter 4 says, he was calling those things that be not. Was light yet? No. Light didn't exist yet. But he was calling those things that be not as though they were. So when he spoke light, it was as though he were recognizing light. But you know, the cool thing about God is when God says something, it comes to pass. So when he said light, like present tense, light, it came to pass. There was light. He, so in the King James, let there be light and there was light. Well, that's how God uses his faith. He speaks words and he uses his faith and his words are containers of his faith, which is the power of God. So, Jesus says, have God's kind of faith. And basically, in so many words, I'm going to show you how to use God's kind of faith. And that's exactly what he does. Verse 23, For verily or truly I say to you that whosoever shall say... Now, I've often said when I was teaching this that this is available to whosoever, but really it's not. <laughs> because one day I was teaching this and the Lord showed me something that I hadn't seen before. He said, notice it's not just whosoever, it's whosoever shall say. You can be a whosoever and not say. And if you're a whosoever and don't say, it ain't going to work. And I'm convinced there's a lot of Christians today, they, they understand about faith, they've read the scriptures, they've heard Brother Hagin, they know about what faith is, but they're not saying they're not talking to things. Well, yeah, but Dr. Bell, I feel funny talking to things. Well, then you're not going to see things happen because you've got to say, you've got to speak. And that's exactly what he says here. Whosoever shall say, so it is available to the whosoever if they're willing to say. Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, we're going to come back to that, and shall believe, or excuse me, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Now we've read that, I don't know how many thousands of times we've probably read that. 
But have you really thought about it? Believe that those things which he saith. Now, I was, again, it's funny to me how as, as a teacher, I learn a lot what I'm teaching. <laughs> because the Holy Spirit is the one doing the teaching, and he'll use my mouth and he'll say things, and I'll, in the back of my mind, you know, I'm sitting there listening <laughs> to myself, and I hear myself say something and go, ooh, that's good, I'm going to have to study that out. <laughs> but I heard myself say one time, You've got to believe that what you are saying is coming to pass. So in other words, it's not just, well, now I'm in my prayer closet. I'm going to sit myself down right here and I'm going to say some things. And I expect them to come to pass. And I believe I receive that what I say is coming to pass. And then you walk right out of that prayer closet. You go right out to your wife and say, my back doesn't feel good. It hurts. Well, you're still saying <laughs> You're still talking, and what you are saying is coming to pass. So if you don't want your back to hurt, don't talk about your back hurting. <laughs> talk about how it's healed, praise God. How Jesus bore your sicknesses and carried your diseases. By his stripes we were healed, and if we were healed, then I am the healed. And Satan, you can't put symptoms on me because I'm the healed of the Lord. If you want to say something, say that. Because we've got to keep saying, we're a whosoever that shall say. So it's what we're saying that's coming to pass. Now, you may go to work, and you're just, you know, shooting the breeze with some folks around the water cooler. And you're just talking along, and you start saying things, and there's that little prickle in the back of your head going, oh man, you shouldn't be saying this. Well, you need to listen, particularly if you have prayed as David did, David in the Psalms counseled that what you should do is pray that a watch be put on your mouth. Now a watch is like a watchman that's at the top of a parapet of a castle and he's looking across the horizon and he's seeing what's coming. And if the enemy's coming, he'll yell down as the watch, he'll yell down, I see the enemy approaching. Well then they get ready and they start, you know, get ready to fight, get ready to fortify the castle. So a watch is like an early warning system. So if you will pray, God will put a watch on your mouth. And he'll give you that little tickle. Now it won't be, he won't hit you in the head with a sledgehammer and tell you, don't say that. You know, those of us in the early Word of Faith days, we were confession beepers. You know, and I still, to this day, pastor will talk, he'll be up teaching, he'll talk about being a confession beeper. And there's still a part of me that says, yeah, you know, I think we still need a few confession beepers. Because what I hear some Christians saying these days, oh my goodness, I don't want it to come into pass. You know, particularly in their own life. So, but you know, we did carry it a little bit to extreme, there's no question. Yeah, I, that's what your confession is, and I believe every word of it. I know we used to really just jump on folks. Well, I don't jump on anybody anymore except myself. I will jump on myself. And that doesn't even require me to say anything to myself because I know what I'm thinking. <laughs> Amen. So whenever I start to say something, I'll go, mm -mm -mm, and I'll just mm, I'll try to chew those words back and not say them. Because what I'm saying is what's coming to pass. And it says here, you must believe that those things which you are saying are coming to pass. And once you do that, you'll have whatsoever you say. So we've got to believe that. We absolutely have to believe that. Now here's the thing. You know, there are people, I've heard them say, now you know, Dr. Bill, I just can't believe that. I can't believe I'm supposed to just say certain things all the time. Or I can't believe that the Red Sea really actually split. Well, you know, they're 100% wrong. They can believe it. If they wanted to, they could believe it. Now, this is what the Lord spoke to me as I began to study for this particular message, is that believing is a choice. And that's, well, if we wanted to title this tonight, that's what we'd call it. Believing is a choice. Now, think about some of the things that people believe. There are people... And I'm talking about even people who identify themselves as Christians. Now, I saw a statistic recently, and I don't know whether to believe it or not. It was not substantiated. And you can read a lot of things, for instance, on Facebook, and you have no idea whether it's true or not. 
But it was a statistic that somebody quoted. And it may be true, I don't know, can't attest to it. But they said 14% of people that identify as Christians don't believe that the Scripture is literal. Four, only four, I'm sorry, got it reversed. 14% believe that the Scripture is literal. The rest of the percentage, whatever that would be, what would that be? 90, 86%, 86%, 86%. Math is not my strong suit. 86% actually don't believe the Bible is literal. 14% do. Now, I don't know if that's a true statistic or not. But I wouldn't actually be surprised, sadly. But the thing is, we've got to believe that the Bible's true. I like what I heard Pastor Keith Moore say one time. He said, do I believe the Red Sea was split? Absolutely. Do I believe Jesus was raised physically from the dead? Not spiritually, not weird, freaky, funny, ghost stuff, but he physically was raised from the dead. He said, listen, folks, if you don't believe that, you're not born again. And I'm sure a lot of people swallowed hard on that one and went, what? Because, see, according to Romans chapter 10, verses 8, 9, and 10, What saith it, the word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is, the word of faith which we preach. That's what Paul preached was the word of faith. So I'm in good company preaching the word of faith. But he said, the word of faith which we preach, that, this is what the word of faith that we preach is, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, or Jesus as your personal Lord, and, and, means that what follows the and is just as important as what was before the and. Okay? So believe Jesus and receive Jesus as Lord. Yeah, absolutely. Most folks go, yeah, okay, I believe that. But then the latter part is, and believe that God hath raised him from the dead. If you don't believe that, you don't meet the qualifications of Romans chapter 10, verses 8, 9, and 10, and you are not saved. But if you do, if you receive Jesus as your Lord, you believe God ra raised him physically from the dead, then it says, then you shall be, shall be, most emphatic way of speaking in English, shall be saved. And that word saved is the Greek word sozo. Now I like to pronounce it sozo with a D because that little D is in there. A lot of people say sozo, and that's fine because the transliterated version of the word is S-O-Z-O. But in the official pronunciation of the Greek, there's a little D in there, so it's sozo, okay? Sozo means saved, delivered, healed, protected, made whole, spirit, soul, body, financially and socially, and delivered from all temporal evil. That's the Greek definition, the full definition. Greek words, I love Greek words. They are, as they say, pregnant with meaning. They have a lot of meaning in those words. And if we are saved, we are saved spiritually. We are healed physically. We are delivered. Well, that's deliverance from any form of problem, whether it's an addiction or, you know, satanic oppression or demons or whatever you want to look at. Deliverance. Saved, healed, delivered, protected. That's Psalm 91 protection. Made whole. Well, wholeness covers a whole lot. Made whole can be made whole even financially. But it goes on to say made whole financially and spiritually and delivered from all temporal, which is things that are subject to time, which is the world we live in, issues or problems. So, I mean, man, it covers everything. But the thing about it is there's a lot of people claiming to be Christians, don't believe Jesus was raised from the dead. I'm sorry. You really need to examine where you're at as a Christian. And I use that term advisedly because you've got to believe in that. And what do you do? You have to choose to believe that. Now let's think about some things that people choose to believe. There's a lot of people in this world today that choose to believe that homosexuality is fine. There's not a problem with it. As pastor said when he was preaching, Sadio, it's just another form of love. That's what a lot of people say. But that's not the case. The Bible explicitly says that homosexuality is a gross <coughs> sin, an abominable sin. That it Basically, if you read the Hebrew, it's pretty graphic. It says it makes God want to throw up. I mean, that's pretty rough. Make God throw up. Okay? That's pretty, that's pretty rough right there. And there's a lot of people that say, well, yeah, but see, you're just closed-minded. Yeah, I'm closed-minded. Why? Because I'm right. Amen. 
Well, you arrogant person, you. I'm not arrogant. There's not an arrogant bone in my body. I simply know the Bible is true. I simply know that God is God. And what he says is the truth. Jesus said in John 17, 17, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So he said in his word that homosexuality was a sin, an abominable sin. Therefore it is. It doesn't matter what my opinion is. It doesn't matter what your opinion is. God said. Okay? But here are all these people that have chosen to believe that homosexuality is okay. Why? Because the world says it's only fair that they should love the way they want to love. Well, you know, that sounds fine. In the natural, you look at it and say, well, yeah, you know, I mean, I guess it's okay if it's okay with them. It's, you know, whatever. No, it's still sin. Because the Bible says it is. And I don't have the right to an opinion when it comes to the Bible. Well, I have a right to my opinion. No, you don't. Not if you're a Christian. You literally do not have a right to have an opinion. You only have a right to believe the Word of God. Now, a lot of people get all cramped about that. Well, that's just not right. See, that's because you're speaking from a worldview that is motivated by the world itself. That's why Romans chapter 12 says, don't be conformed to this world system. See, it's easy to be conformed to a world system when we are constantly bombarded by the TV, by the news, by magazines, by newspapers, by people around us, by folks that are talking and saying things like, well, yeah, you know, homosexuality is really all right. We need to let it go. I mean, even Hillary Clinton recently said that Christians are going to have to get with the program and change their doctrine to, to come up with the times. Well, I'm sorry, it doesn't work that way. You know, it's not like God's up there going, Oh, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. Let me scratch that out and start over. The Word is forever settled in heaven. Well, if it's forever settled, He ain't changing it. And He certainly doesn't change His mind. So, <laughs> so I'm not going to change my mind on it either. Now, they can argue all day, they can fuss at me, they can tell me they're going to draw and quarter me, but the Bible still says what the Bible says, and that's just the way it is. So I, again, have a right to only believe what the Bible says. Now, the world has chosen to believe that homosexuality is all right socially. It's fine. It's on TV. Everybody says, oh, it's all right. Why? Because they chose to. It was a choice that they made. I can guarantee you, 50 years ago, if you were to stand up and say, yeah, homosexuality's fine, boy, you'd have been beat with a bat. I mean, when I came up in high school, if, it, if there was even a hint that somebody swung the wrong way, you know what I mean, it was a scandal. But today it's like, oh, wow, <laughs> you're, you're really hip, aren't you? You're right up here with the crowd. Like it's a good thing. Well, see, attitudes have changed. But guess what hasn't changed? The Word of God hasn't changed. Now, you choose to believe. Well, there's people that have chosen to believe that evolution works. They've chosen to believe that the origin of the species is some single-celled thing that multiplied into a multiple-celled thing that crawled out of the ocean and on and on and on, all this stuff. Well, you know, it's a funny thing about that. Darwin was a theological student. He actually started out studying theology. Then he went to the Galapagos Islands and he saw all the stuff he saw, and he wrote the book, The Origin of Species. And to hear some people tell it, you would think that the book, The Origin of the Species, was the Bible itself. Oh, my goodness. I mean, Darwinism, everything he said was 100% right. Have you ever actually looked at some of the things he said in that book? <laughs> he said, for instance, one of the things he said was that if you look at man, the light-skinned man is more highly developed and evolutionarily developed than a dark-skinned man. Well, I'm sorry, but that would make him a racist. By any definition, I would think. Yet he is their great prophet. <laughs> You know, he also said in the same book, The Origin of the Species, he said, one looking at the human eye and how it works and functions, it would be absurd to say that that occurred through natural selection. 
Well, funny, you know, uh, I've seen some science programs that say that because of what Darwin said, that eyes developed so that we could see because of a natural need on the part of creatures to see, and so that eye developed just out of, you know, evolution. But that's not what Darwin believed. That's not what he wrote in his book. He said there was a designer because the human eye was proof that there was no way that could have occurred naturally. It had to be supernaturally created. So, I mean, even Darwin didn't believe what he wrote when you get right down to it. And then finally on his deathbed, he recanted the whole thing. He said, what I ever think I wrote is just crazy. You know, and I hope, praise the Lord, I hope he was born again before he slipped on out into eternity. I don't know if he was or not. But the thing is, people have chosen to believe in evolution. And I like what Brother Hagin said about a theory. Theory of evolution. <coughs> Brother Hagin's definition of a theory is ignorance of the facts under discussion. A supposition based on ignorance of the facts under discussion. And it's funny to hear him say that, but it's absolutely a legitimate definition. If you look it up in Merriam-Webster, you look up what a theory is, in so many words, that's exactly what it is. A theory is a supposition, a surmise, of something of which you have no hard evidence. There is no hard evidence of evolution. There's no hard evidence of, of some single-celled creature eventually becoming a multi-celled compound proof of that. There's nothing that ever shows that some animal becomes some other animal. As a matter of fact, the Bible specifically says that one kind of animal cannot become another kind of animal. It just doesn't work that way. And if the scripture says it, then that's the truth. Okay, so they've chosen to believe stuff like that. And they have great faith in evolution. Entire programs on television just absolutely say, this is fact. And it's taught that way in schools. This is fact. Yet, it has to be taken on faith because there's no evidence for it. There's no hard scientific evidence. It's not repeatable. It cannot, the scientific method cannot be applied. So what am I saying here? You've got to choose to believe something. You choose to believe in evolution. You choose to believe that homosexuality is all right. You choose to believe all of these things are true just because the world's saying it. And if you hear it repeated often enough, it will become part of you. I mean, Goebbels found that out in his uh, propaganda during World War II. He found that if you repeat a lie often enough, now you know it's a lie when you're saying it, but if you repeat it often enough, then people will believe it and they'll swear up and down that it's absolutely the truth. Same thing with global warming. You could say all day long that it, man caused climate change, but there's no evidence that man caused climate change. Now, is the climate changing? Oh, it changes all the time. It gets hot, it gets cold, it gets hot, it gets cold. Cycles occur. You know, winter happens, summer happens. <laughs> and in the same way, there's seasons of the earth. Things happen where they get hot and cold. But... There's nothing that shows that man caused any of that. Matter of fact, it's pretty arrogant on the part of man to think that he could cause problems with the climate. But that's another story. The point is they chose to believe that. Well, you can choose to believe the Bible. You can choose to accept what God's Word says is true. And here's the thing. You've got to believe that what you are saying is coming to pass. I think my mouse died. <laughs> there we go. Don't you love it with computers? Let's go back over to Esword to the scripture and go to Luke. That's where I had you turn originally. Luke chapter 11. <laughs> okay. Luke chapter 11. Let's look at verse 9. And I say unto you, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find knock, and it shall be open unto you. Now the word ask here is an interesting word in the Greek. A lot of people read it and say it's just, you know, please, sir, may I have some more? <laughs> you remember the old Dickens thing with a little kid asking for more extra bread? 
Oliver Twist, you know, please, sir, may I have some more? Like that kind of ask. That's not the kind of ask he's talking about here. This is an ask that is a demand. We are to demand, and actually the Greek says demand is a partner. Ask, and it shall be given to you. Demand it as a partner. Here's the thing, and again, I, this is something I said when I was teaching one day. I was on the radio, and I was teaching, and I said, faith is never passive. Faith is never passive. And when I said it, I thought, uh-oh, I need to write that down, because that bears some study. And sure enough, ask and ye shall receive is demand as a partner. Now, you're not demanding from God. Brother Hagin taught on this, and he made it clear. We're not demanding from God. We're demanding our rights as believers from the devil. The devil's trying to make you sick. You're demanding health because Jesus bore your sicknesses. He carried your diseases. If he bore them, I don't have to bear them. Right? So, you know, it, it would be a miscarriage of justice for me to bear sickness and disease because Jesus bore it for me. I don't have to. So I demand from Satan that he take his hands off my body, and I must be the healed of the Lord, because the Word of God says I am. Therefore, I demand that I'm the healed of the Lord. And if I'm passive about it, see if I'd like you know, a little offer twist, please, sir, uh, Satan, please don't make me sick. You know what he's going to do? He's going to laugh, because he could care less. He has no feelings for you. He wants to destroy you. And really, when you get right down to it, he doesn't want to destroy you because he hates you so bad. He really doesn't care one whip about you one way or the other. What he sees you as is a danger to his kingdom. Because if you stand there as a Christian that know your rights and privileges in Christ Jesus, and you speak the Word of God, and you operate according to the Word of God, and you speak the Word, and you get people saved, and you get people healed, and you get people filled with the Holy Ghost, you are a danger to his kingdom. He would like to take you out of the way simply because he wants to stop the flow of the Word in the earth. That's the only reason he wants to stop you. He really does not have anything personally one way or another against you other than you're one of those Christians, little Christ. And you know, it's like, <laughs> it's like a high school girl. A little high school girl dates a boy, and he, you know, is mean to her somehow or another, and she gets mad. Well, she can't go beat him up. She's just a little slip of a thing. But what does she do? She goes and tears up his picture tears that picture up. Why? Because it's the closest thing she can do to, to hurt him is to destroy his image. What's the way Satan is? He looks at us and sees Jesus because we're Christians, little Christ. He looks at us and says, well, I can't do anything about Jesus, but I can tear them up. That's again, see, that's his only motivation. It's not personal with him. He just wants to destroy the image. So the thing is, we need to get some backbone spiritually. We need to demand some things. We need to stand on the Word of God. When it talks about there in uh, uh, Mark 11, believe you receive, the believe is to reach out and take. Reach out and take. There's nothing passive about reaching out and taking. Now, the Lord's offering things to us freely. Again, it's not His fault. It's not Him we're demanding anything of. He's freely giving us all things richly to enjoy. But if we don't reach out and take it, then we won't receive it. That's what receiving is, is reaching out and taking Think about the woman with the issue of blood. I mentioned the woman with the issue of blood earlier. What about her? She heard what Jesus taught. Well, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. So she heard Jesus talk. She heard, the Scripture says she heard of Jesus, which I believe means she heard His message. She heard the Word, so faith came. We know she had faith because Jesus commended her on her faith. She, he said, daughter, your faith has made you whole. So she had to have faith, right? So faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. She heard the Word. And then she said to herself, now if you read the Scripture, it says, she said... That's words. She said to herself, If I but touch the hem of his garment, then I shall be made whole. So she made a decision to reach out and touch Jesus' clothes. She didn't go up and ask Jesus to be healed. 
A lot of people did. That's fine. But she didn't ask. She came up and took it. She reached out and grabbed his clothes to the point that Jesus said, somebody touched me. Why? Because it said he felt power flow out of him. Now, the King James says virtue, but as Brother Hagin has pointed out many times, that word virtue in the, in the Greek means power, anointing. He felt or discerned a transmitting of the power of God from him to her. And he knew that somebody had touched him with the touch of faith. And so she touched his garment. She was made whole. Well, she, really, if you think about this, now, if you, again, you've got to think in terms of this situation. She is a woman with an issue of blood. She shouldn't have been in public because she's not allowed to be in public according to Jewish law. She's not supposed to be around any other people according to Jewish law because she was unclean. She's supposed to stand off from people and yell, unclean, unclean, so they won't come around her. So the fact that she went into the crowd was a stoning offense. The fact that she reached out to touch the rabbi's clothing, because Jesus wore rabbinical clothing, you know, wherever he went, to reach out and touch that clothing was an even stronger offense. And to say within herself, if I but touch his clothes, I'll be healed, and didn't even ask him to be healed, she was taking it. But now did Jesus say, somebody touch me. Go find out who touched me. I want to I stone her. Was he upset? No, he wasn't upset. He was, he was happy. He was excited. He said, who touched me? And when finally she came up, and notice what it says, she confessed. You don't really confess unless you think you did something wrong. So that's why she was kind of cowering back going, oh, Lord, I'm sorry, but I just believed if I touched your garment, I'd be made whole. Jesus said, daughter, don't worry. Your faith has made you whole. Why? Because she took it. She took it. She, the scripture says, received it. Well, receive means she took it. It was an active decision on her part to make a move and receive it. Now, again, faith is a choice. Now, I go back to where I was in the hospital. When I was in the hospital, as you know, uh, I had, uh, because of the celiac disease, of course, it was undiagnosed. We didn't know that's what it was. All I knew is that I kept eating and I kept losing weight. And I kept eating and I kept losing weight. And the more weight I lost, not the stronger I got, which is what you'd think. I mean, if you weigh 600 pounds and you start losing weight, you know, the doctor told me when I went to see him, he said, whatever you're doing, keep it up. Because he was happy. You're losing weight. This is great. But I kept losing, and I kept losing, and I kept getting weaker, and I kept getting weaker. And by the time it was over with, I couldn't get out of bed. And it was at that point, <laughs> being a man, that's just something about being a man. I guess it's that testosterone somehow affects your brain. <laughs> I don't know what it is. But Belinda kept telling me, you've got to go to the hospital. And I, kept, I was laying there going, I'm fine. <laughs> I couldn't move. I couldn't lift my arms. I couldn't lift my legs off the bed. I couldn't get out of bed. I'm fine. And it wasn't a face confession. It's just me being stupid. <laughs> that testosterone at work. So I'm laying there in bed. Finally, finally, it got to the point, if you're laying in bed and your wife is changing your diapers, you know, you feel like suddenly, this is really wrong. I need to get this fixed. <laughs> You know, I mean, duh. So I said, call the ambulance, let's go to the hospital. Well, by the time I got to the hospital, since I couldn't lift my hands off the bed, I couldn't lift my feet off the bed, I couldn't roll over. If you asked me a question, I could barely talk, such that I finally just would use up, uh, well, figure for up for yes and figure down for no. That's all I could do is lay there and do that. And the doctors ran tests, and they did everything they needed to do, and they couldn't figure it out. They said, we just don't understand. And so there are the doctors looking at me. By that time, I was less than 150 pounds, probably closer to 130. I was six foot two, laid in bed, skin and bones, literally could see every bone in my rib cage. And I'm laying there, and the doctor said, we don't know what this is but you are failing to thrive. That was the official term that they were going to put on my death certificate. You are failing to thrive. That's exactly what they put on my mom's death certificate. 
That was her cause of death, failure to thrive. Because it basically means you're not getting any nutrition, you're starving to death, and you're going to die. And they said, you've got about a week to live. And frankly, there's nothing we can do for you. We need the hospital bed for other people that we can help, so we want to send you home. Well, you know, when you hear that, you kind of go, this isn't good. <laughs> you know, I realized, uh, they really have given up on me. They weren't giving me any medicine. They weren't doing anything for me. They just wanted to roll me out of there and get the bed back. I'd been there for over eight weeks. Laying there, couldn't move. So, and all they do is poke, prod, and take blood and run tests and say, you know, your numbers are way off. <laughs> well, duh. You know, why? We don't know. So, there I am, giving up to die, and I had a decision to make. Now, see, this gets back to faith being a choice. I could have decided very easily, very easily, I think I'll just go home. I mean, I've got a week to live. All I've got to do is lay here for five more days, and I'm out of here. And I can just go home. But I decided something as I was laying there. I said, no, I'm too young. I'm 62 years old. I shouldn't be dying at 62 years old. My life spans 120 years plus, you know, or rapture, whichever comes first, as Pastor says. So I said, you know, I'm, I'm a middle-aged guy, 62. That's just barely middle-aged. I'm not going to let myself die. But there I am laying in the hospital. They told me, you're, you're, dead. you're out here in a week. I had to make a choice. Now, thankfully, I had Pastor. I had Miss Janie. Miss Janie had given me a list of scriptures. And Belinda was reading them over me every day. I was reading them when I could because I could, I could only read a few sentences before I couldn't read anymore. I didn't have the energy because I wanted to read it out loud. Words. I wanted to speak words. But I, I was so weak I couldn't speak very much. So I let her read them. At least I could hear it. And so I just made a decision. Laying there in bed, I made a decision. I'm going to live and not die. Glory to God. This is going to be a testimony. And so I just gritted my teeth and said, I choose faith. I choose to live. And sure enough, i tell you the other thing I did is I prayed and I said, Lord, give these doctors wisdom because they don't know their head from a hole in the ground, apparently. They, <laughs> they run all these tests. They've looked at all these numbers and all they can say is your liver numbers are wrong. Your kidney numbers are wrong. Your blood count is wrong. Everything. Well, I said, okay, why? We don't know. I said, well, wouldn't it be good to find out? Well, we ran every test we know to run. I said, what about the test you don't know to run? And they said, well, we could send you up to Chapel Hill and see what they say. Like, you know, you don't trust us. Well, no, they said I was going to die. So I said, uh, yeah, let's do that. <laughs> so they put me in an ambulance. I couldn't move. Bounce, bounce, bounce. I go up to Chapel Hill. I get up there, and they start running all the same tests that these guys already run at High Point. And I'm like, guys, I got a week to live. <laughs> you know, I mean, we don't have time to do all this over again. But yeah, we got to be thorough. We got to run all this over again. Then they started doing some tests they hadn't done before. And sure enough, they go into my small intestine, and they found out I had celiac disease. And it, I have read some facts about that later, you only find a diagnosis of celiac 20% of the time even with the right test. It is hard to find that diagnosis. But they finally found it. Once they found it, it was like, oh, now we understand. And I said, okay. They said, you're not getting any nutrition. I said, well, guess what? I eat and I lose weight. Duh. And they said, yeah, you're not getting any nutrition. All the cilia in your small intestines have been cemented to the side of the small intestine, and there's nothing to receive the nutrients. So they just flow straight through. I said, yeah, I know that. I've been dealing with diarrhea for two years. You know, and the whole time I'm telling my doctor, the doctor's like, well, you know, that happens sometimes. Two years? But, you know, whatever. <laughs> I'm laying there, and they say, yeah, it's celiac disease. All you got to do is not eat wheat. Well, practically everything I ate was wheat. Bread, pasta, cereals, gluten, wheat gluten's in everything. 
You really got to watch. Soy sauce is made with wheat gluten. I mean, you really got to watch what has gluten in it. So they said, just don't eat gluten, you'll be fine. Well, the only problem is, I only had a week to live. I'm less than 130 pounds. I'm six foot two, and I can't move. So they said, uh, you know, this has progressed to the point that you're not going to survive unless we feed you intravenously. So we need to put a pick line in and feed you intravenously. And I thought to myself, now, they could have done that before. But you know why they didn't do it? They gave up. In High Point, they said, why put a pick line in and prolong his life? We're just going to let him die. That's exactly, I asked the doctor later. He said, yeah, I mean, we could have prolonged your life, but to what end? We didn't know what was causing it, so we're just going to let you go. Well, that's a shocker. <laughs> so they put me on this intravenous feed, and I started building up a little bit of strength. For too long, I could lift my hand off the bed. I was like, whoa, hey, check that out. And gradually, I got a little stronger. And gradually, I got a little stronger. This was just this clear liquid they were feeding in, but it, had, it was full of all kinds of nutrients. And it was going straight into my veins. So I was getting direct feeding, so to speak. And I kept getting stronger and stronger. And finally, I got to where I could, I could sit up on the edge of the bed without fainting. Because when I'd sit up, I would faint out completely within less than 20 seconds. I'd just fall over. And the physical therapist would come in and say, get up and, and walk. I couldn't stand. I couldn't walk. And they just laid me back down and go, well, nothing we can do for you. <laughs> they gave up on me too. So I just kept coming back, and I kept coming back, and I kept getting stronger. Finally, it got to the point that the physical therapist would come in and say, stand up, and I could stand up for about a minute, and then I'd fall out. But I could stand up, and it was just a process. Now, I've had a lot of people say, well, Dr. Bill, why did you just believe for supernatural healing? I did have supernatural healing. It's just like the second miracle that Jesus performed. Have you ever read about the second miracle? A lot of people read about the first miracle, turning water to wine. And it says this is the first miracle that Jesus did. But you know, the same scripture says that Jesus uh, healed a guy who was healed as he went. In other words, it was a process. But then after that, describing that incident, it says this second miracle Jesus did. So it called him being healed in a matter of time as a process, as a miracle. So I say, when people talk to me, I say, I received a miracle. Did you jump out of the bed immediately and were completely well? No, my legs had atrophied. My muscles had atrophied. I couldn't move. I couldn't lift my leg. One of the first exercises I did was to try to lift my foot off the bed while laying on my, flat on my back, and I couldn't do it. And I kept working at that and working at that, and it took months to get to where I could lift my leg off the floor. And even sitting, just to be able to raise my leg up, I knocked the camera, but to raise my leg up was impossible. The fact that I could do that now is like, it's like a miracle to me. So the thing is, yeah, I received a miracle, but it occurred over time. It's kind of like pastor tells a story about his toe. That hole in his toe didn't heal up instantly. It occurred over a period of time, but it's no less a healing. It's no less supernatural. It's no less the power of God. It just took some time for the restoration to occur. But if I had not chosen to operate in faith, if I had instead chosen to lay there and to believe the doctors and believe their report, I'd be dead. Now, praise the Lord, I'd be in heaven. Hallelujah. But I got some things to do down here yet. So I decided to stay. And now I can get up, I can walk, I can do, I can move, and I get stronger every single day. And, you know, here's a guy supposed to be dead. But I tell you what, when I believed God, it was not passive. I had to grip my teeth and say, I am coming out of this bed. Praise the Lord. And you know, they'll say, if it's the last thing I do, it would have been the last thing I did <laughs> if I didn't. But, praise the Lord, I got out. I got out of bed. I can go to the bathroom on my own. Hallelujah. You know, I tell you, to have your 26-year-old son change your diaper in bed is about the lowest feeling that a father can have. 
to be that helpless and that pitiful and that disgusting that the experience that a guy has for the first time changing diapers is his dad's diapers. That was disgusting to me. I couldn't stay. I literally cried over that. It broke my heart that he had to deal with that. And I got so mad at the devil. Because see, it wasn't, it wasn't anybody, any human's fault. People say, well, the doctors could have diagnosed it earlier. Yeah, but doctors are just practicing medicine. They, they barely get it right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? They're just practicing. But the great physician knows exactly what he's doing. And faith works. It's a choice. And that's what I want to leave you with tonight. Demand is a partner from the devil. Speak the Word of God with authority. Stand for the Word of God. Make a stand on God's Word, and it will work for you. And if you don't work it, it ain't going to work. If you're whosoever that's not saying, it ain't going to work for you. But you've got to choose to say it. Now, I know we've gone a little long. <laughs> I have a tendency to do that. I have to remember Brother Osteen's revelation, the short-winded shall speak again, and tell myself... <laughs> Brother Bill, shut up. Because <laughs> I just, I have to unhook. If I, I could keep going, believe me, I got a lot of scripture, I could keep going. But I didn't, uh, I didn't choose to write any notes so I could quit. <laughs> just uh, unhook here. But praise the Lord, I just thank God that I'm the heel of the Lord. And every day I make this confession. Every cell and every organ in my body functions perfectly as God designed it to function. I tell you what the doctors told me. They said, there's nothing we can do for your liver. Your liver will never be right. Your liver numbers will always be skewed. They'll never be right. Your blood chemistry will always be messed up. That's just the way it is. My blood chemistry now is perfect. Absolutely every level, every reading, everything is 100% perfect. And they said, this can't happen. A liver cannot, from, that is, is uh, suffering from cirrhosis, which is what they diagnosed, not because of alcohol, but they call it non-alcoholic cirrhosis of the liver. Cirrhosis can't be reversed. It can't be healed. But it can be when the Lord gets a hold of it. And my liver is now working perfectly. My kidneys are all functioning perfectly. My heart is functioning perfectly. Every number is right. Even my thyroid doctor, because the whole thing threw my thyroid off. Even my thyroid doctor said, you know, last time she checked, she said, your numbers are all just exactly what they should be. I said, well, praise the Lord. She said, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because it shouldn't be. <laughs> so, praise the Lord. It, faith works. God's Word works. But we got to put it to work by choice, by decision. Praise the Lord. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity we've had to share your Word. We thank you, Father, that you've given us revelation knowledge of your Word and made it alive and living to us. And Father, we stand on your word. We proclaim that we are the healed. Jesus bore our sicknesses. He carried our diseases. By his stripes, we were healed. If we were, then we are. So we are the healed of the Lord. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right. We need to receive our offering. And uh, I have no idea how we're going to do that except electronically, Pastor, as far as receiving the offering. We'll just catch you Sunday then. Praise the Lord. If you want to give any time, you can. There's a donation button on the website and also Square Cash. There's all kinds of ways to give, and we will receive it with great excitement because it allows us to preach the Word of God. Get us a building. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.